August 14, 2019. Can I get a roll call, please? Yes, Commissioner Wood. Here. Commissioner Wesley. Here. Commissioner Cohn. Here. Commissioner Branch. Yep. Commissioner Pattis. Here. Commissioner Walker. Here. And Commissioner McDonald. Yes, here. Uh, Commissioner Michael Cohn, would you please lead us in our pledge? I'm going to miss that. <laughs> uh, there are speaker cards in the front lobby area that must be filled out by anyone, including the applicant. If uh, you would like to speak on any item this evening, uh, speakers may address items on this agenda at the time that each item is considered. The speaker cards are green cards. If you have one or have not filled out one yet, please head out front and do so and get them up to us and you can pass them to either side over here as you do so. Each speaker will be given three minutes to address the commission. You will use the podium to my right, to your left. There is a flashing light uh, or light system on the front of it that flashes green, yellow, and red. Uh, green is your time is continued. Yellow is you have one minute left, and red means your time is up, so you please be respectful of that. Next is the approval of the agenda. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda? No. No changes? Okay. Do I have an uh, approval uh, motion for the agenda? So I move by Michael Cohen. A second? Second. Second by Commissioner uh, Chuckwood. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Many opposed? Okay, our next item is the approval of minutes from June 12th. Remember that meeting, right? <laughs> Are there any changes or any notes that we need to make to the uh, minutes? Except uh, that I don't think I was quite as late as the minutes lay out. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to change? <laughs> uh, seeing no changes, can I get an approval uh, and a motion for the minutes to be submitted? Seconded by with, with the reservations. Okay. Same <laughs> motion by Cohen and second by Commissioner Wood. Uh, this is the time for the public to speak on items not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. Items from the public that are not part of this agenda will be taken under consideration without discussion or action by this commission except as authorized by law and may be referred to staff. I'll now open the public comments period. Seeing that we have no public green cards, are there any public comments in those or are those agendized comments? I like the bell. What was that all about? I felt it was super important there for a moment. <laughs> Either that or my time was up on Jeopardy. Yeah, huh? yeah I'm, sure. All right, I'm gonna close the public comments period. Um, our next item is the uh, agenda and schedule matters. Uh, for each agendized item, there will be a presentation by city staff. For items that involve applicant requests, I will then ask the applicant to address the Planning Commission if they so desire. Then I'll open the public hearing and call out the names of those members of the public who have filled out a speaker cards to come forward to the podium, again, to my right, to your left. And uh, as um, I reiterate that the red light flashing means your time is up. You'll be given three minutes to speak. I will then close the public hearing after all the speakers have addressed the commission and after all questions regarding testimony during the public hearing have been answered. After the public hearing is closed, the Planning Commission will deliberate on the items and may have additional questions of staff. We cannot take additional testimony or questions from the audience after the public hearing is closed. This commission will then vote on the agendized item. Our first item is A. Uh, the Monte Verde. This is a public hearing on request by Blue Mountain Communities to construct a 124 unit detached single family subdivision across three vacant parcels at the southeast corner of Peabody Road and Doby Lane. Primary access to the subdivision shall be off Dobe Lane. The subdivision consists of five house plans with three elevations per plan, community landscaping, common open space areas, a private community dog park, and a protected wetlands areas. The proposal also includes a general plan amendment and zone change from the existing MU mixed use and CS service commercial designation to RLM, which is residential low medium. To initiate the residential project, development agreement is incorporated as well. The proposed mitigated negative declaration finds that the project will have no uh, will not have a significant effect on the environment. Our staff pres person for this presentation is uh, Mei Li Xian. Thank you. Thank you. You pretty much summed it all up. I think we're all set. <laughs> Thank you. No, good evening, commissioners. Those of you joining us this evening, my name is Mei Sheehan, and I will be presenting the item. All righty. So to start off, the project site is made up of three parcels, totaling approximately 24 acres. 
um, at the southeast corner of Peabody Road and Dobie Lane. Um, the majority of the site is vacant. However, there are some legal non-conforming residential structures on the uh, northeast corner of the site. Current zoning uh, designation is service commercial and the existing general plan designation is mixed use. Uh, the residential project proposal here today does require that both a zone change and a general planned amendment um, be conducted to allow for RLM designation, residential low to medium density. Here we have a larger contextual map to provide us a better feel of exactly where the project site is. This big red star is our project site. So to the west of the project, we have a handful of industrial uses. All of these buildings actually front Huntington Drive, which comes right around where this red dot is. So only the uh, back corner of this building is gonna be visible from the other side of Peabody uh, Road there. To the north, you have some single family residential units, um, as well as the Cambridge Estates community. In addition, we have Golden West Middle School and Vanden High School. Immediately to the east of the project site is a vacant parcel. Uh, this parcel is actually within Solano County's jurisdiction and it acts a little bit as a buffer to some commercial uses further to the east. There is a storage facility and a tow yard as well as Republic Services. And then to the south of the project site, you have Air Base Parkway separating the site from the Travis Air Force Base property and facilities. This project proposal today contains several different components. Um, a development agreement is required. I'll elaborate a little further on that as we get along in the presentation. As I stated before, a general plan amendment and a zone change are required to support the residential uh, proposal. And in the next few slides, I'm going to cover the development review aspect, the tentative subdivision map, house plans, and community design plan. The tentative subdivision map. Um, a map has been composed to divide the 20, roughly 24 acres into 124 single family lots. In addition, parcels have been proposed to accommodate common open space areas, stormwater treatment areas, and wetland uh, preservation space. In addition, there are several easements that currently traverse the project site. The easements belong to the city of Fairfield, the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District, and the city of Vallejo. Here we have an image. Um, I have a couple images of the tentative map. This is the actual tentative subdivision map where you can see right here is the city of Vallejo's easement. It's for a water line. And then along the uh, city, of Vallejo. city of Vallejo, yes. Yes, their water main runs all throughout Fairfield actually. <laughs> And then both the city of Fairfield and the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District have easements running along the south side of the project site. Kind of cuts off right here. Um, I do have, once this loads, this map is just a little bit easier on the eyes. It's a simplified version of the tentative subdivision map overlaid on the contextual. I just felt like it was just a little bit easier for all of us to read. So here you can see the internal streets proposed. There are two entrances off of Dobie Lane. I do want to note that the west entrance is a right in, right out only for vehicle movement. Um, this is to ensure that there's a reduced amount of traffic impact on the signal here for Peabody and Dobie. Um, also on this, you can see roughly, I know it's a little bit thin and I'll get uh, deeper into it throughout the presentation, but this is where the community or neighborhood parklet would be. And then down in this corner on the south end, you would have the dog park. These lightly rough um, outlines here along the south edge and this uh, northwest edge are the wetland areas that have been identified. And then in gray, we have our stormwater treatment areas. Quick questions, if you sure. don't mind real quickly. Um, is there a, a divider on the road there to keep them from turning left? Will there be a a barrier in the middle of the road? Uh, yes, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little tiny, um, I think we call it like a pork chop 
piece, if you will. Okay, it's so they won't be, be able to just make so, that left correct, illegally, Correct, right? yeah. Okay. So it's going to force you as a right in and a right out only right there. And then the um, non-conforming residential units, are those staying, going, and? Those will be um, demoed. Yeah, those demoed. will uh, not remain. Are there people living in them now? You know, I can, uh, yes, looks like. Okay, and have they been given notice? Are they here tonight? Are there any problems? Or? Okay. That's Mr. Garvin, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> so moving along to our house plans, um, there are five proposed floor plans. Each of them are going to have three elevations. Uh, all the proposed homes are two stories with an attached two uh, car garage with the exception of one floor plan that actually offers a three car tandem garage. Every lot provides a minimum of 450 square feet of private open space. And the subdivision does meet the city's parking standards with a minimum of 248 covered spaces and 124 street spaces for parking. So because the property is proposing so many floor plan and elevation combinations, I thought it was best to go ahead and just select one architectural style for each plan. So here you have plans one through five. Um, Monte Verde is going to be a blend of a craftsman style, Spanish style and cottage style architecture. They're distinct from one another through architectural elements such as the roof line, window treatments, and movements in the facade. But they are still cohesive with one another through the color schemes. I did also want to note here that specific conditions have been placed on the project to ensure that there's some architectural enhancements. For all the craftsman style homes, we are going to require that the columns in the front are tapered, meaning that they're going to have a larger base and um, taper up towards the top. So these two, plan one and five, are both craftsman style. So if you can envision these entrance columns will um, just be a little more built up. And then in addition to that, we did require that all the house plans incorporate a few more um, architectural details. Um, such as adding veneer, porch railings, exposed corbels, deeply recessed garages, window boxes. Those are just examples. Nothing specific has been required, but we're giving um, the professional architect some leeway just to add in a few extra elements to the plans. So I went ahead and selected both the smallest floor plan and the largest floor plan for us to look at today. Here we have the smallest floor plan. It's a total of uh, 2,020 square feet. You have three bedrooms and two and a half bathrooms with the attached garage. And again, you can see in the back here that we are meeting our minimum 450 square feet open space. There's actually a little extra room and this would be a typical lotting. Moving on, this is your largest floor plan with uh, 3,121 square feet. It's five bathrooms with three and a half baths, an optional loft, and a tandem three-car garage. Again, that backyard meets our minimum 450 open space requirement. Here's just a quick rendering I thought was nice um, just to give you guys a feel of what the streetscape might look like. Uh, once the development is built out, should it be approved. In addition to the house plans, the developer has provided a community design plan. The plan includes an architectural theme, which we kind of just covered, the cottage, Spanish, and craftsman style homes. Common open space areas, including a neighborhood parklet and a neighborhood dog park, total to approximately one acre of active open space for the community. And then lastly, there are community details that are provided as well, such as the entry signage, fences and wall details, mailboxes, and lighting and landscaping. Here in the conceptual landscape plan, I can highlight a little bit better exactly where those uh, neighborhood parks are. So right here is a little parklet, and I do have a little further on some enhanced view, so you can see exactly what's gonna be going on right there. And then down on the um, south end, we have the dog park. Also on this plan, you can see these colored lines here. These represent the different types of walls and fencings. The subdivision will have a masonry sound wall around the um, entire community to ensure that there are no noise impacts from the roadways and adjacent industrial and commercial uses in the area. 
also on here it's a little small but you can see roughly where the entry sign would be located as well as the community mailboxes right here and on the other side right there and of course being a landscape plan you can see all the proposed landscaping there will be landscaping along peabody road Dobie Lane, the interior uh, streets, and throughout the subdivision. I have a quick question, if I can. Sure. So on, I, I did notice the landscaping plan along Peabody included the trees. Yes. But did we address anything about landscaping along the wall because of our problems of people writing on the wall and painting the wall? So putting landscaping right up against the wall, is right, that what you're or, asking? Or some kind of thing like, like cat's claw or something that will grow up with wall? So Do you have any policies on that, uh, David? That we don't have any adopted policies, but if the commission wishes to make a recommendation on a uh, mechanism to address that, whether it be uh, 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 anti-graffiti paint on the outside of that wall or vines or something. Is there uh, such a thing as anti-graffiti mm -hmm. paint? Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. It, Thank it's you. much easier. The paint washes off easier. And a little bit deeper in here, you'll see a rendering of the wall. It is quite nice. You may not want ivy along it, um, but we'll, we'll get to that. So uh, this is just an enhanced um, plan of the little neighborhood parklet. So there will be a play structure, and there's area for picnics and seating, open space, um, ample landscaping just to dress up that area. Um, something to note actually here is uh, the developer and their team were very clever on putting this neighborhood park here this is actually where that Vallejo water line runs through so it's a great way how big is the park I want to say it's 0.51 acres if I have that roughly accurate I'm looking over to our developers here I want to say it's called out somewhere in that plan set that you guys were all provided with yes they're roughly the same size they come close to about an, uh, an acre 0.51 Right, we got it right on the dot. Yeah. And you can see uh, for context, there's a house lot that yeah. cuts into there, gives you a sense of the a typical And this house is the lot largest house. It's got that three car to garage. the park. All right. Here is just um, a highlight of that dog park. So, of course, it's going to come with some rules and way stations for the pups. It's going to be fenced in. Um, I don't know exactly what the rules are, but from the dog parks that I've been to, there's usually a small dog section and a large dog section. And then here are some quick renderings of what that proposed sound wall might be, um, the entry signage, and the mailbox clusters. Um, right now, I do want to just pause for a moment to make note that the project has been conditioned to establish an HOA. The HOA will actually own and maintain several of these aspects that we just went over, including the wall. So in terms of that anti-graffiti paint or ensuring that it's um, clear of graffiti, that'll be the responsibility of the HOA. Even though on it's both on both sides? On, Correct. Even though it's on, on both sides, yeah. Correct. As condition, the HOA will maintain the wall in And also um, the uh, wetlands area, so is that included in the HOA also? Correct. The wetlands will be included in the HOA's ownership and maintenance, as well as the smaller um, stormwater treatment areas along Dobie. All right. Uh, so like I was just talking about the stormwater treatment areas in the wetlands, there are four stormwater treatment areas. Three of the smaller ones are along Dobie Lane. Those will be owned and maintained by the HOA. The larger basin is parallel to the Air Base Parkway on the south side, and that will be owned and maintained by the city. Um, there were seven wetland features that were identified through a biological assessment conducted for the project. Those uh, features were found to not be under the jurisdiction uh, or federal or state jurisdiction. But just to play on the safe side, um, approximately three acres, including the wetlands and a, a buffer surrounding area around them, have been completely avoided by the development and will be preserved and owned and maintained by the HOA. And then just through this image one more time to show you, those, the, here are the three um, smaller stormwater quality treatments and the larger one. So wrapping up the development review aspect of the project, city staff has drafted several conditions of approval. Uh, listed here are the key ones I felt were important to highlight. So starting with some public works conditions, 
The developer shall be required to install several Adobe Lane improvements, including installing curb gutter and sidewalk on the south side, installing five foot wide ba uh, bike lanes on both sides, LED street lights, and a crosswalk with electric flashing beacons. Um, and then conditions were also drafted for the city of Vallejo's water line. We wanted to ensure that the development would not be impacting their water line. So we added conditions not, um, to prohibit any trees being planted within the easement. And also any trees within an eight feet of the easement shall include root deflectors to ensure that they're not gonna be overgrowing and, and encroaching into their uh, easement or to their pipe. Furthermore, the developer is required to work with the city of Vallejo regarding uh, design criteria and development constraints in relation to their water line prior to construction. As previously noted, uh, we did call for some enhanced architecture. In addition, we called for some enhanced landscaping at the entrances of the subdivision because we have those smaller stormwater quality areas. We just wanted to soften the look when you first enter the community. So we've asked for some enhanced landscaping there. There was a noise study conducted for this project. So per that noise um, study, we are applying the mitigation measures as part of the project conditions. It includes that the perimeter lots, so the lots that are gonna be parallel to Peabody Road and Air Base Parkway, to meet certain window and exterior door uh, sound standards. And then in addition, the wall is part of a noise mitigation. So the wall shall be a minimum of 10 feet to ensure noise attenuation from the roadways. And then Lastly, as I had just mentioned, uh, the a homeowners association is required in order to own and maintain several aspects of the subdivision. All right, so moving on to the development agreement portion of this uh, project proposal. Um, as I stated at the beginning of the presentation, an, an, a development agreement application was submitted. So before diving into the terms, I thought it would be important to understand exactly why the agreement is necessary. So just a little background information, as some of you may be aware, the city currently has an adopted Northeast Area Fee Program. The fee program uh, collects development impact fees to help facilitate growth in the area. And so due to the project's existing commercial zoning, it was not initially considered to be part of that program. However, with this proposed residential project, the project would be contributing to the growth in the area and it would be benefiting from the Northeast fees um, collected to sponsor improvements in that area. Therefore, staff felt that it was imperative to ensure that the developer had to pay some sort of equivalent fee to the Northeast fee. So going into the terms here, um, the developer shall be required to pay, like I said, an equivalent development fee for each residential lot. Payments shall be made prior to any final map recordation. And then should the city go and amend the Northeast fee program to include this particular project site, then the developer will just be subject to those Northeast fees and will no longer have to pay an equivalent fee. Obviously, we don't wanna be charging them two fees. We just wanna make sure we're getting the proper amount. And are you waiting for that because that's a city council issue? Uh, the but reason why we don't know whether it's going to be in that northeast um, fee program now because it, the city would have the city council would have to annex it in. So uh, there's really not an annexation program. Essentially, you would have to amend the whole program. Uh, there's there's a detailed study that has to be done to adopt the program that identifies the relationship of each individual house to the need for infrastructure. So you don't just annex in, you actually have to amend the whole program and revise, revise the program and adjust the fee uh, for, for everyone. So it's not a simple matter of, of annexing. Uh, so uh, uh, it's not something that we can do simply and quickly. It's something that takes probably anywhere from a year to 18 months to go through that. Update. So what could happen is the houses could be built and then you have to deal with the individual homeowners rather than putting it on now before the homeowners buy? So what would happen is at the time the lots are recorded, the developer would pay in advance the fee. So the homeowners never have to deal with the fee okay. or, the, or the terms of the development agreement. It all and gets dealt with. And you would refund it if it isn't carried through or doesn't happen or 
So there's no refund. Uh, no. Essentially, one one of two things will happen over time. They'll either, either pay the fee, or the, the fee will be that they're or the program. or if they don't pay the fee and record the map, the what it'll give the city time to do that update to the fee program and include this property in because we know that it, the intent now is for it to become residential. So one way or the other, the intent is if this is residential, they're going to pay. If they do it before the fee program is amended, they pay through the development agreement. If not, then they pay through the fee, through the fee program, Great. but not both. Perfect. And, and so lastly, um, with this agreement, it will vest the project entitlements valid for 10 years with optional extensions subject to the council's review and approval. Lastly, um, a mitigated negative declaration was prepared for the project. Potential significant impacts identified were air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, greenhouse gas emissions, noise, and tribal cultural resources. All of these impacts can be reduced to less than significant levels through the mitigation measures identified in the in, uh, initial study. So with that, staff is recommending that the commission adopt resolution 2019-7, granting approval of the tentative subdivision map, the development review, and recommending to city council the approval of the development agreement, general plan amendment, zone change, and council the adoption of the mitigated negative declaration. And I'd Thank be you. happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Maylee. Now we have four speaker cards, Holland, as, as well as we'll, before we get to the applicant, um, we have questions for staff. Gary. Um, the first question I have is uh, Clorox has a uh, system there for warning. Um, would this subdivision be tied into that system so that it, there's, a, there's a warning system Clorox has to identify neighbors if there's a leak or something that is in place now with what's already there? Yeah, I'm not aware of anything specific that Clorox has. We can certainly reach out to Clorox uh, to ensure that they're aware that this project is here and request that they add them to that. That's something we absolutely can do. I know there's some system they have to be able to notify the neighbors in case of a leak. Um, also in the, I think we call it the North uh, East project, we have a um, condition in the CCNRs identifying Travis Air Force Base. Did we, are we going to include that in this one also? I couldn't find it in, in so here. So let's take a look. It should be in there, and if it's not in there, we can certainly add it in. The, there, is a, there is a standard notice uh, that we have drafted uh, for any development uh, out in the vicinity of Travis Air Force Base. I don't see it included in this packet but I'm very familiar with what you're referring to. We can make sure that that is. We, do we need to make that as part of the motion? Yeah, to what I would that? recommend is that uh, as a part of the conditions of approval, add the, the city's standard Travis Air Force Base proximity notice. Okay, that's all the questions I have. You're talking about a disclosure for the potential homeowners? Yeah, it goes on the yeah. CCNR so that when people buy the house, the CCR identifies that Travis right. is there and they can't sue later on and say, I didn't know there was so much noise. And, the same thing as we did with the golf course easement for Rancho Solano and Paradise Valley. Yeah, the county currently, the county and the city currently have uh, local disclosures that are required for the transfer of any property that mention both of those items within the areas that they're well, required to be in. Here, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if you wish to recommend that. Um, Good recommendation. That, that's perfectly appropriate. Commissioner Wood. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, the current, it looks like the, uh, the, the current zoning is commercial services, the general plan is mixed use. What is the rationale for changing this to, you know, uh, 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 houses that, you know, relative, relatively low density, large houses that are being built several other places in the city at this time? So in this area, I'll go back to um, a few slides here. In this area, you do have residential uh, units across the street. So it's not inappropriate to have more housing. Um, and we have we found this particular lot hasn't had any traction in terms of commercial development in some time. So Maybe really there was, and there was a market study um, conducted for the area as well. If you can go back to one of your slides shows that's the one I'm looking for. Okay. So let's, uh, let me give some longer term historical context for why the general plan and zoning are what they are in that location. 
you actually look where that red dot is, the cursor that uh, for some reason is a red dot tonight, uh, you have the former remnants of what was called the Travis Aero Club. It was essentially a private uh, air uh, airstrip uh, tied in with the Air Force Base that when we adopted our general plan and the current general plan designation, that was an operational uh, airport. And you can see the direction of the runway. It actually ran, uh, the, the overflight for the, for the planes went right over this piece of property at a relatively low elevation. So when the general plan was adopted with that aero club in place, uh, the idea was uh, you could not put uh, uses on that property that were potentially threatened uh, either by plane crash or, uh, or noise from those planes. I'm gonna say it was maybe eight years ago, somewhere in the last 10 years, the Aero Club actually closed down. Uh, there are quite a bit of uh, environmental uh, constraints on that property. There's uh, uh, some endangered plants that made it impossible for them to maintain and repair uh, the operations out there. And so they closed the, the Aero Club. At that point, the basis for which the city put that uh, mixed use and commercial zoning on that property was no longer in play. Uh, the city takes a look from a market standpoint. Is there a market for the kinds of uses on that property? And there's actually quite a bit of vacant land out in the northeast area where uh, commercial service kinds of activities can go, uh, including along Industrial Drive just to the east. There's a whole strip of vacant land along there. Uh, there's still some vacant properties over along Horizon Drive uh, and Western Street for that same kind of activity. So it's not like there's not a whole, uh, there's not additional land out in the Northeast area for that same use. So with that basis, staff felt that we could support changing the general plan at this location. I should just make a correction. It wasn't a private club. It was the MWR Aero Club for the Travis Air Force Base. Correct. And they moved from there to the Rio Vista Rio Airport. Vista. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. um, okay, and that leads to my next question is that uh, what, um, uh, what, why are we going uh, such such low density at this uh, given the need for housing in this area? So the the density is proposed by the applicant. They are welcome to propose whatever density they wish. Uh, as staff looks at this, one of the things that w we take a look at is uh, is uh, do we have enough land designated at various other densities that this this specific proposal uh, doesn't conflict with other needs of the city in terms of including needs for higher density housing. Um, when we adopted the train station specific plan just to the north, less than a half a mile north, uh, there are, I'm going to estimate about 3,000 units of multifamily development that that plan calls for, uh, essentially all around the, the train station and then uh, essentially running a, on a strip all the way from the southeast corner of Peabody and Vanden, essentially right there, and then running all along Vanden Road out to the east. That whole stretch is all planned for multifamily. So the feeling on staff stamp, from staff standpoint is that we have plenty of land that's available, uh, including land that uh, immediately the applicant could come in tomorrow right on the south side of the train station. There, there's about a 13 acre property. So there's plenty of land that's sitting there available for multifamily development. And this, this proposal didn't conflict with uh, meeting that demand. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners for staff? Commissioner Wesley. First of all, Maylee, uh, great job as always. Well done, gives us a nice overview. A couple of questions center around, first of all, that large structure. So as these built, how tall is that structure, the large white structure? No, I d I'm sorry, I, d I don't know it off the top. Okay. It's probably in the 30, 35 foot range. So it doesn't appear to be a challenge or a problem in terms of height, as far as views or anything like that? If you looked at that, you feel okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. As you can see, it 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 moves in a direction away from the right, from the right. project site, so it recesses well. as you look at it. Got it. Next question is around notice. So, how far did the notice go? Are we still doing the 500 feet, especially when you have open areas? 
How much note, how far did the notice go? Did the residents of this area get noticed that this facility was being done? It was the 500 foot notification, uh, the newspaper and on site posting. Right. I remember the last time we talked about this where we were in a situation where if you 500 feet, you were still in the grass, right? So we said on other items like this, we should make a notice that would extend to the residential area. I think in order to do that, we have to actually put that on an agenda and make that part of um, the process, right? We can't just randomly exercise that through every any project we feel. We have to put that as part of because right now the standard is 500 feet so maybe we need to look at how we can change that standard so that moving forward there's more flexibility in determining whether or not it should be whether it's brought to the Commission prior to the notice and said here's this what's going to happen what do you wh wh who should we notice because this is a clear example again when you look and there's probably not a single resident out there that has any idea exactly. this is happening yeah so uh, the the noticing comes straight out of our city code city code says 500 feet is what the notice is state law says 300 feet so the city code already is nearly right, you know, right. double what the state law says so we notice specifically in conjunction with with the the uh, what the city code requires now uh, what we have been doing in recent months uh, for new projects that have come in, and this project has been around for quite a while, uh, is we have been holding neighborhood meetings early in the project uh, timeline. And what we do is we identify, uh, because it's not a public hearing, we're choosing to hold a neighborhood meeting. We actually identify what appears to be a logical boundary. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no right or wrong. You could, no matter how far you go out, the next house that didn't get noticed is going to say, "Why didn't I get a notice?" So we at least try to identify a logical boundary. So moving yeah, forward yeah. on projects like this, we are actually going out and holding neighborhood meetings. We've done that several times. This project had a neighborhood meeting very early in its timeline before we started that. Uh, city-sponsored project program. So. I would like, since we've had this exact discussion the last time, I would like to codify it some type of way, not maybe in this event, but make sure, because there are other projects in Fairfield that will have the same kind of geographic setup where there are some houses, mm -hmm. but they don't fall within 500 feet. So and if the commission wanted to... Meeting, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, to do a neighborhood meeting makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. but if the idea of notice is to give notice as opposed to just do a process. The idea is to give notice. So we should codify and make something that says, in these situations where you have very low density in the 500 foot area, we come up with some kind of arrangement, as opposed to the next time we get here, we have the same conversation again. So, so the question is, is, how does, can the commission go about uh, having an agendized item to discuss that, whether or not we want to propose that code change? Because I think there's arguments against it. Um, you need a motion to make that agendize. If the point. commission wishes to agendize that, I would recommend that you make a motion, perhaps uh, whether it's now or after this item is completed. Uh, I can agendize that for our very next meeting, and the commission can debate and discuss what you think. I propose that. Like. Well, let's let's just hold that till I, I mean we'll Go get to, to it, but let's okay. not hold the the applicant up this evening for that. Let's just get to it when it comes. Got to it. The, next question. Um, around, so there's one house that's occupied. Currently, of the, what is it? How many houses is it? Four or five? What do we know is happening there? There's only one house, but it looks like more structures as I look here. It's a little hard to see. Yeah, I believe there's one house and they have like ancillary structures out there. I don't okay. know if they're storage Compound. or. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And they're, it's a month to month and we can notify them. And, all right. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Excellent presentation. Thank you. I'm um, going to bring the applicant, if they so choose, to address the commission. Yo. Go to the right over here. Yeah. And state your name, your position. Uh, but then, uh, Carlos Yanez. Carlos Yanez, uh, forward planning manager for Blue Mountain Communities. Uh, just brought it briefly. Thank you. Miley did a wonderful job, so I'm not going to repeat anything that she said. Uh, follow up a couple of the questions that he, I heard here. Uh, as far as notice, that is something that concerns me too. Uh, and during our neighborhood meeting, I did notify everybody in that entire area, not just 500 feet. So they were there, they had the opportunity. Um, in addition to that, one of my personal things is I walk the neighborhood. 
I'll go knock on doors and ask people, you know, look, I'm thinking of developing this. What are your thoughts? Do you think this would be better? Do you think that would be better? Architectural ideals, I'll have ideas and share it with the community. Uh, so they're aware. They may not have been given notice of this particular meeting, but they're very much aware of what our plans are. And I really try to be available. I'll take calls all day long from the public on the different projects that I work on. Uh, I do have my design team here, um, Mr. Felipe. Um, and sorry, I keep forgetting your, McQuay. I keep forgetting his last name. I always call Scott, these people by their first name. Uh, McQuay <laughs> and Annika Carpenter, uh, Landscape. Uh, so if there's any questions, we're all available to uh, respond to those. I had a quick question, just noticing that there were no single story plans that we at least saw. Is there a single story in this development? I tried to do it, but because of the open space restrictions, I just couldn't quite fit a single space it, in there. It seemed like the most you could get is a 1,400-something square foot in there at best, right? Yeah. Utilizing so the garage. So it wouldn't work. The plan one, if you notice, sort of has a pop-up in the front that has a bedroom. That was originally designed a single story, and we just couldn't make it fit. Right. I know that being in real estate, there's a tremendous demand for single-story homes, especially as the aging baby boomers getting up and downsize. And so... I, it would have been nice to see some single stories in there. You know, an alternative to that in the design, it would seem to be to me, would be that uh, since you're squished for space, is that you create a master uh, bedroom downstairs, so we, that. So yeah. Well, I looked at it. I just saw third and fourth bedrooms. Okay. Design. Yeah, that makes sense. The master bedroom downstairs. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that way when an older couple who, who wants to move in will have it downstairs and then their guest or their family can go upstairs. Yeah, I, I looked at all, maybe I just missed that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions? To uh, thank you so much for, uh, does Scott McQuay or um, Tom Felipe want to address? I actually have one question okay, for I'm Mr. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the demand for, for higher density single family homes or a higher density uh, product on this site. Is that something that's, that could be considered? We did financial performance in different models when we first started the design on this and we found that this would be the most likely, um, the highest demand for this particular product in that area. As Mealy said, there is a, quite a bit of area that's already zoned for multifamily and we're looking at that. but the demand isn't there right now. Tom Filippi. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Filippi, Filippi Engineering. We're serving as a civil consultant. I was just going to touch on two questions that had come up earlier. Uh, the question about the Clorox early warning system. Clorox, we serve as the civil consultant to Clorox. We have regular meetings with them. I, I'm committing to you that we will find out what those uh, warning systems are and, and make sure that that's conveyed and we'll have that as part of the project description. The other one was the avigation issue related to Travis Air Force Base. That's something we regularly do. It's called an avigation easement. We not only show it on the, uh, on the map, the final map, the easement is put on there. There are certain re uh, restrictions that are conveyed, and that restriction, as it shows in the final map, is then shows up in every individual title report as, uh, as it uh, goes through the process. Under, under the CCNRs. Under this, and it's included, included in the CCNRs as well. So there's the legal notification on the final map which is also referred to in the title report. There's a list of exceptions that the buyer has to sign off on, and one of those is a navigation easement. It's a standard wording that we've done for Nut Tree, for Travis, uh, all the facilities in the area. So it's something that's regularly done and not an issue. Thank you. Scott McCoy. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for that was a, an amazing report that was a lot of a lot of information that went in there so we're here for any questions if you have um, any um, and if you wanted to see some of the proposed enhancements um, I do have a small 11 by 17 piece of paper of, of what we were thinking along those lines in case you wanted to see them at this time a uh, quick question that um, I wrote down and forgot to address any um, was there any consideration desire or talk about gating this community Really didn't see that to be an appropriate use 
Right. Right. I'm just curious. Okay, any questions? I have one more speaker, Annika Carpenter, the Ripley Design Group and Landscape Architect. Awesome. Hi, I'm Annika Carpenter, the Project Landscape Architect. I just wanted to speak to the point that was brought up about the sound wall. And um, we did have a staff, a, a city staff meeting where we discussed the plans. And uh, I know that the maintenance uh, department asked us to add the trees that were along Peabody, but they, um, they had concerns or he had concerns about adding uh, too much plant material because of the um, know, homeless or vagrant or inviting that element towards that in that area so um, I there is a product that's a graffiti coating that does when you try to spray paint or draw on it the the it beads up and doesn't attach to the wall so there is a coating that you could put on and that could be an alternative to vines or shrubs that could can you use that on that kind of wall that you're using? Because yeah. I noticed that wall's got an architectural element to it. It's not just a cinder block straight wall or anything. Yeah, it's just a it's it's just an outer coating, so it's okay. a clear coat that you put on the outside. Yeah, I just wanted to expand on Anna's point. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, that was actually something that staff discussed um, while reviewing this project because there is. Um, a bit of a gap here between where the sound wall will be and the roadway is. Our police department and our public works department did have some concerns about encampments being kind of sandwiched between landscaping and the wall. Alternatives to that too is if you heard of cat's claw, which is a, one that attaches itself to the wall and it's not a bush, it just grows up the wall. So hopefully in further projects when staff looks at these for landscaping they might look at that I th there might be one or two other type products that do the same thing that grow up and attach to the wall and then grow out. Wonderful. Okay, uh, commissioners, any more questions to any of the speakers? I will bring this back to the um, commissioners and for further deliberation and comments. Do we have any more comments I'll, we want to start with? I'll make uh, a motion if they don't have a comment. I have a quick question. Um, to, to one's clarification, the city of Lale water easement, um, I, can, I think I can see on here, but there is no properties that are going over that easement. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, correct. There's no properties that'll and go over that easement. And I, it looks like the properties abutted on the back ends of the two, two uh, Street C and Court C. What is, gonna, is there going to be a fence that makes it so people can't go through there? Is it going to be a walkway? What is, what's going to be there? So um, here I have the tentative map. So there are a couple of uh, buffer parcels, if you will. So again, you have the neighborhood um, parklet, and then this is an open space one. So it will be open space. You can walk through the area. Uh, Vallejo just doesn't want anything constructed on top of it. Understandable. And so going back to the HOA discussion, maybe this is a question for the developer. Is the HOA going to be the one that responsible for cleaning that? I mean, I see that as a potential haven for garbage and everything else collecting in there. Okay, and will that be lighted if people are, I mean, is it gonna be a walkway? Is it gonna be lighted or is it gonna be grass? What's it gonna be throughout that easement? Yeah, if I recall, there's lighting along the um, internal streets here, but I don't believe that there's street lighting along that little pathway. Perhaps in the little parklet, there could be some lighting. I don't recall. I just look at it as if, it's, if there's no lighting, what, and, and Again, it's hard for me to tell here how wide that's going to be. Is, is that going to be an access way where you're going to have people cutting through? So it's a 15 foot easement is how wide it is that comes through here. And it's not, it's, it's, it's going to be paved with concrete or not? It's no, they, uh, Vallejo doesn't want and just, much on it. Just for proper etiquette, we need to direct our questions to staff and not the applicant at this point, just because that's off. Thank you. Yeah, the, the material is decomposed granite. So it's a very fine little rock material that's uh, appropriate for walking on. Okay. And then this is the 
age-old question we ask every time we have a housing development because we hear it from everyone in the community. What's the status with the school district? The impact? So, um, as we <laughs> you probably tend to hear us say often, uh, the Fairfield to Soon Unified School District tells us that they have capacity. Um, essentially, they move. I, are you sure this isn't back. in this Fairfield? Is, I thought it was in Travis. Yeah, this, this is, is Travis, Travis, and I think Travis actually oh, has I'm more sorry, capacity. I might be than mix matching so. my projects. I apologize for that. I've been working a lot with Kim for the um, Fairfield Sassoon. I apologize. Um, so for the Travis Unified, I, excuse me, I should probably grab some notes. Um, we did route to them for this project. I actually don't believe I received any feedback from them. And I, file. Yeah, and I can fill in some additional details. I don't know if you can go back to that same uh, that overview exhibit. Sure thing. See if it goes far enough. Uh, not quite. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. We can talk a little bit about the schools. So, some context for Travis uh, Travis Unified School District. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are currently three elementary schools uh, that serve uh, the city of Fairfield portion of Travis. There's other elementary schools up in Vacaville that are also within the Travis School District. The three, school dis or the three elementary schools were constructed originally to serve all the development on Travis Air Force Base. Over the last 10 years, Travis has uh, substantially cut back on the number of housing units on base. They've actually eliminated housing. And so Travis has generally found that there, there's more than enough capacity uh, with the existing three schools to serve the uh, city of Fairfield. There are two school sites that have been reserved for new elementary schools. We've worked uh, over the years with Travis to identify additional uh, capacity needs. And so they've determined that two additional schools will serve the long-term build out for the city. Uh, one of the sites is, and I was hoping you could see it, it's just at the very top of the, pro of the map under the L in, or directly below the L in the word contextual. Uh, if you come down to where the blue, uh, where the blue uh, 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 background stops where it becomes the map, right? Yeah, generally in that area, uh, right next to Gary Flotty Park uh, in the Gold Ridge subdivision is a vacant piece of property that the school district uh, uh, owns and is available for them to build a school whenever they feel it's uh, it's the right time and that the, got whenever all the, the state funding. can fund it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but as we know, it's the school district's responsibility. This project uh, pays the school fees, which then the school district builds the schools. There's another school site that's identified within the train station specific plan. Um, let's see if I can. Uh, it's. Uh, more just to the uh, down below the P in map, uh, oh. right there down, and keep going at an angle to the to the southeast. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, right there. There's another elementary school and site. The, so essentially, there's two two sites available uh, whenever the school district feels they're ready to build. Well, I think you're talking about this one here. So using this little light that I just got, um, right here is the middle school. Yep. Right here is the high school. Mm -hmm. Right here is the grade school. Yep. And the secondary grade school is right here. Yeah, yeah. And Travis has been looking uh, over the over the years <laughs> at whether or not to build another middle school uh, to handle their capacity in uh, somewhere up in in Vacaville. Uh, at which time, uh, you know, that opens up that capacity and potentially opens up if they need more land uh, for Vanden High School. It's been a part of their plans, but it's an ongoing study that they do. Uh, and uh, we, we continually are providing them with development information out in the Northeast, and they've yet to tell us they have any issues. Right, and I apologize again for the <clears throat> district mix-up, but I did just flip through my files. I, I did not receive any um, concerns from the Travis Unified School District. Thank you. William, any comments or questions? Commissioner Wesley? No? I'll Commissioner Branch? Commissioner Pettit? Okay, get a motion for 29... Okay, I'll make a uh, motion that we approve resolution number 2019-7 <clears throat> with the conditions that the Clorox system notification is included, uh, the Travis Air Force Base Aviation Agreement on CCNRs is included. Um, the anti-graffiti paint. And the anti-graffiti paint, if my fellow commissioners the agree, is put on those, yeah. coating is put on the walls. And what happened, what I assume happens the resolution if the, includes the subdivision map and all that stuff, right? 
What happens if there is no Clorox notification? Well, I just want to clarify the motion first. Yeah, so I, I would take I that sure. as direction to staff to, to communicate information with Clorox. Uh, I'm saying physically, if Clorox doesn't have a notification process, because I'm not aware of it, you might be aware of it, but I'm not. So they I'm do. saying, like, if we put, if we put a condition in there that's impossible, then I just want to make sure we're... Well, I, I remember that, I, I specifically remember when they had their last leak, a, a system was put into place to notify the neighbors of any future leaks. I don't know what that system is. I'm just, if that system does exist, then I, we can make that clarification. If that system does exist, this subdivision should be included. That's what I'm looking for, exactly. Connection to any. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the condition is that if that notification process exists, that it become part of this resolution as well. Yeah, Condu connection to any system. Right. If it, yeah. so, which means if, it, if, not, if there's none, I just didn't want to right. force Clorox to all of a sudden have to no, create no, I, that no, notification. Yeah, yeah, there was, there yeah, wasn't yeah, the intent. Yeah, yeah. Asking for it. I understand that. Um, okay, can I get a second? I'll second. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Look at that snappy over there. Commissioner Wood on a second. Uh, all those in favor with aye? Aye. aye? aye. Any opposed? So moved unanimously. Again, May Lee, thank you. An incredibly good presentation, one of the best. Very good. And thank you. Applicants, thank you for being here and your support of the city. We appreciate it. Another item of business, the, nope. the no, motion we began to talk about, which simply says, I, I would term it more of adequate notification. So something to the effect that, especially in certain areas where it's mostly rural or open land, we have to consider an alternative to the 500 foot window. So yeah, so the process of just putting that on the agenda for we can have a discussion have to decide whether or not we want to ask. Right, some of the things in that line, and I second that motion to do that, but some of the things in that line, for example, is you could be doing something here, and that road that is there goes right through this neighborhood that's 5,000 feet away and causes nothing but problems. So it has to be in the discussion. I hope we, you discuss the, yeah. you know, what, that, what, what does it impact yeah. so that those people are notified. Okay. The impact is the key. What, 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 who does it impact? So I, I second that motion that it be put on, on the agenda. as an agendized item. Okay. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Okay. So um, uh, we'll put that on the agenda for your next meeting. Okay. Uh, director's report. Dave? Yeah, I've got four uh, items to, uh, to mention. So the first is you have a notice at your uh, at your table uh, there. Uh, I had mentioned at your last meeting that there was being planned a uh, an uh, educational forum for planning commissioners throughout Solano County uh, regarding CEQA. That, that has now been set. It's going to be the 29th of August, which is the uh, last Thursday in August, so two weeks uh, from today or from two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, so what we would like if anybody is interested in attending uh, that we uh, find out from you by next Wednesday. I'll put out uh, an email to you tonight just as a reminder. Let me know if you're interested. You won't be here. Okay. Um, uh, I would recommend that you attend if you're available. Uh, many of you attended last year. There was a countywide commissioner training. It's in the same location over in Vallejo. Uh, that was a general planning uh, practice uh, uh, educational forum. This one is specific to the California Environmental Quality Act. We talk a lot about it, but if you don't get some regular refresher, a lot of the concepts and terms can get uh, a little lost. Um, and importantly, uh, over the next few months, you will be looking at an environmental impact report. We don't do those very often. Uh, so if you attend this, it will give you a really good uh, preparation for reading an environmental impact report. So that's the first item. Um, the second item is uh, we've had sort of an uh, informal summer break, just the, for the way things fell. We didn't have any items for the last uh, uh, month and a half or so. We've got a number of items that are all lined up for your next at least two, three meetings, four meetings out of the next three at least, or I'm sorry, three meetings out of the next four. Uh, we've got a number of items scheduled, so uh, we will be holding uh, meetings at least the next two for sure, and then probably uh, both in, in October. Um, related to that, uh, we had talked at the last meeting about the need to nominate a new chair and vice chair, and the decision was made to hold off until 
uh, uh, the two vacancies that are being created by Commissioner Walker and Commissioner McDonald were refilled. Um, and so I'm hearing that at this coming council meeting on Tuesday, the appointments will be made, which means at your next meeting, uh, uh, you will have your next uh, term of commission. And so I uh, intend, to, unless the commission wishes otherwise, but, uh, to put on your agenda a uh, nomination of chair and vice chair. Uh, so if, unless I hear any opposition, I'm going to put that on the agenda and I would encourage you to be thinking, you know, who do you want to nominate? And maybe you want to be nominated. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just appointed to represent us. At some, well, yeah. So if you don't come back, right, we'll then, need to bring that up. CGB in the Rockville, but those will all be part of that appointment processes. So you'll have to put that on the agenda to have the commission appoint people. As well to the, to the CDBG, uh, the advisory board? Right. Okay. And I think it's a committee. It's a, com it's a committee, yeah. exactly. And I'm sorry, the Rockville there's a, there's a uh, Hills Park, Park something oversight who committee. Is, something. Who is currently I, the representative? <laughs> it might be me, although I haven't gone to a meeting. I haven't been no Is it any of the five of you? <laughs> no, but <laughs> Okay. Correct. I know you are. Okay. So I'll put as well the Rockville uh, a, Park Advisory. So make sure if you, you, you take it, you spend some time because it's a lot. Committee. Okay. Um, the last item, just an update on the city manager recruitment. Uh, the last meeting we had, I had mentioned that the council had directed that the uh, recruitment uh, be done nationwide by a recruiting firm and that we'd selected the firm. So the firm uh, is now well into that recruitment. So the recruitment is open and we actually do have applicants, I hear. Uh, and I believe it'll be open for another couple of weeks. So we are uh, coming to the uh, close of the recruitment period for the city manager applicants. So with that, um, I do one other thing I want to mention, and it gets back to the issue of, of neighborhood notice. So as I mentioned, this project had a neighborhood meeting very early on uh, at which we had some people and they were notified. Anyone who attended, we made sure that they were notified. You will have an item on your next agenda, which is one of the first projects. Uh, it's a residential, it's a similar project to this where they're proposing to amend the general plan and zoning. Uh, it's over in Cordelia. And that was the one of the first projects where staff actually uh, uh, conducted neighborhood outreach and neighborhood meetings ourselves. Um, and there were more than 600 people or 600 housing uh, houses in that neighborhood that uh, were identified. So it went well beyond that 500. And that's, our, that's gonna be our process moving forward with new applications. Uh, and as a result of that, um, uh, uh, as a part of our notice for the, for the meeting that we're having uh, next time, all those same people were notified. So that project that you'll see at your next meeting definitely had a much- What, what uh, is the project? Uh, it is a project that Discovery Builders uh, over in Cordelia, uh, they've built most of the, many of the houses over there. Uh, they have a seven or eight acre piece of property uh, along 680 that they're proposing to amend from commercial as well to residential. That's the one that's behind the, uh, the gas station. Behind the, behind the, the power yeah. mart over there, yeah. It was an, an originally intended as commercial, but I guess they've been unable to find any tenants. That's what they've said to us, right. yeah. There was a neighborhood meeting for that, and there were probably at least 75 residents uh, came to that meeting. So I can expect, uh, you know, uh, you'll have, I'll have more people in the audience for that meeting next time. Do you have any timetable when they're going to build up on the bluff? So uh, uh, I was just uh, speaking with them today. They have submitted their grading plans for that. So they're in for a review right now. So that's sort of their first indication that they are moving forward with that. And typically, you know, once you submit your grading plans, it's somewhere within 18 months, I would expect you to actually see some construction work out there. David, I have a question for you. I emailed you regarding that. Um, they just started the grading out there next to Rodriguez on, on Red Top Road. Mm -hmm. Is there plans to widen that road leading the, from two lanes from the highway over to Rodriguez? Yeah, there is a trigger. And off the top of my head, I don't know what the trigger is. I think it's 75 units. I, I can come back at your next meeting and let you know what the trigger is um, uh, for uh, the same for 
CINO, Discovery Builders, uh, to widen Red Top all the way up to the, essentially up to the freeway. And didn't you say that that development that they're, that they're grading for is 140 homes? It's 140, yes. So would that 75, that would trigger that then? So that project, at, at some point along the way of that project, uh, yes, that would trigger that. And so because they are getting ready to start building that, you know, you can expect somewhere in the next year, two years, uh, to see the widening of Red Top Road. I think I that's, think that, that's a huge issue with the, it backs up all the way onto Interstate 80 in the morning with um, parents dropping kids at Rodriguez High. Well, they have, I think there's also an uh, apartment project that was approved on 650, yeah, 650 across, units. Across yeah. the street, Is yeah. That, that one's going to happen anytime So soon? that project, uh, I haven't heard anything specific from them. They were looking, they have the right under the entitlement for that project to actually add some additional uh, units, some apartment units, and they've been looking at whether or not they want to do that. Um, so until they've come to some decision on that, uh, I don't expect that they'll start eventually construction. Eventually, that red top is supposed to come around over past mm -hmm. 12 and connect into Business Center Drive, right? Correct. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe in our lifetime. <laughs> State Correct. Of and last year, you approved a, a preliminary grading uh, a borrow have project for the Hill to start facilitating that connection of red have top. They, have they already started grading that? No. Uh, I haven't seen that either. No. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission for uh, Dave, the chair of the staff? Okay, seeing none, any final comments, Chuck? Commissioner Wesley? Commissioner Cohn? Yep. Ranch? Yes. Thank you, Manley, did an excellent job tonight. Thank you. Gary? Yep. I will say, knowing this is most likely my last meeting, because I did not reapply, um, I just wanted to thank uh, Dave, all of staff, everybody for your support and hard work throughout uh, my eight years of service on here. Thank the fellow commissioners for all of your dedication and putting up with my uh, ego and everything else that goes in play with that. Um, I would say keep in mind that the Green Valley and Business Center area is just a disaster waiting to happen, that we could be devaluing that area by continuing to infill without any sort of transportation uh, needs addressed there. And finally, the biggest disappointment I had was our 1500 Oliver Road project that the commission uh, went down, and I just will say this going out, that I think it's important that we identify our roles as commissioners that our first and foremost priority is to always do what's best for the city of Fairfield, not necessarily 10, 20, 30 community people who live close to the development. It's always what's best for the city, that's our role. And we certainly take into consideration what the consumers and other people feel, but it, it's just important that we always keep come back to that. With that, I'll say good night and enjoy. Thanks, guys. Thank you.